Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for our Delta Omega Honorary Society in Public Health webinar titled Communicating About Racism and Racial Inequities in Public Health. My name is Jennifer Maisel, and I'm the current president of the Delta Omega chapter at the George Washington University. And I'm really honored to introduce today's webinar and guest speakers. Before I do that, I wanted to talk briefly about Delta Omega while we wait for a few more folks to join into the Zoom meeting. Um, so Delta Omega is the National Honorary Society in Public Health, and it's committed to continued learning and networking and professional development in the realms of both public health and health administration. The George Washington University's chapter of the Delta Omega Honorary Society has more than 500 members who include students, alumni, and faculty across various disciplines in the field. Our chapter is led by a group of dedicated alumni and several of them are uh, here on the call on this webinar today. Um, they're members of our executive board and we meet regularly about once a month to organize activities for the chapter of Delta Omega. This year, our activities are focusing primarily on public health skills development with an emphasis on addressing health disparities and inequities. And this is the first webinar in a series that we'll be hosting over the next several months focused on those topics. If you'd like to get more involved with our Delta Omega chapter, we encourage you to follow us on social media. We have Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and we also just created a new Instagram account. So be sure to check us out there. And you can also email us at dltomega at gmail.com. So just to kind of run through what we're going to be doing tonight on today's webinar, uh, this webinar is an hour long and you'll hear from two guest speakers, Dr. Yolanda Lewis Raglan and Dr. Howard Straker, who I'll introduce in just a moment. Um, both presentations will be followed by a panel Q&A led by or moderated by our Delta Omega Vice President, Megana Vijasimha. Since we do have a large group here tonight, we have muted all attendee microphones, um, but you will be able to use the chat box on the side of the screen to ask questions and engage with the speakers during their presentations. This event will be recorded and shared on GW School of Public Health's channels in the next several days and we'll be providing closed captioning on those recordings. So next I will introduce both of our guest speakers tonight. We are so appreciative of them taking the time to join us for this important webinar. So first is Dr. Yolanda Lewis Raglan, who is a pediatrician at Children's National. She's a passionate health advocate, thought provoking uh, lifestyle interventionist and compassionate physician who is board certified through both the American Academy of Pediatrics and American Board of Obesity Medicine. Her global health training and extensive experience in clinical service sets her apart as the subject expert on self-care strategies and obesity management in both children and adults. And Dr. Howard Straker is the Assistant Professor of Physician Assistant Studies at the George Washington University. He's a faculty member at GW where he directs the Joint Physician Assistant Master of Public Health Program and he teaches in both the School of Medicine and Health Sciences and the Milken Institute School of Public Health. His teaching center is on preparing clinicians and public health practitioners to work in underserved communities with courses on health disparities and health equity and community engagement. As a physician assistant and public health practitioner, he has practiced in underserved communities in New York, Alaska, North Carolina, and Maryland. And I've had the pleasure to have taken Dr. Straker's Preventing Health Disparities course and heard a talk by Dr. Yolanda Lewis Raglan. So um, we're so excited for them to be here tonight. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Lewis Raglan. Sorry, thanks. <laughs> I wanted to unmute myself. Um, so I'm gonna start off and I need to share my um, screen here. Sorry about this. Um, and we're gonna talk a little bit here about communicating about racism. So are you guys, Seeing this, everything's clear before I get started? I don't see it yet. Nope, okay. Let's see, this is why we decided to make sure we were doing this correctly. All right, how about now, share. Are we there yet? Looks good. Thanks. Okay, so we're going to start. I'm going to go back up to this first slide. Okay, 
So right. just real quick, Dr. Dr. Lewis Raglan, it looks like you're not in presentation. There it is. Okay, great. Thank yeah. you. I I'm old and slow. So here I go, guys. <laughs> All right. So um, communicating about racism and racial inequities. Um, and just a little quote here, uh, Martin Luther King said, all forms of, any of all forms of inequality, injustice in health is the most shocking and inhumane. So one of the reasons that we here in this uh, community really know that this is a must-have conversation. And I thank um, the George Washington University chapter of Delta Omega for welcoming me and having me talk to you all about this. So um, what are the learning objectives? Like the major learning objectives just to consider the association between racism and health outcomes, right? And so some of the things we're just gonna touch on is acknowledging our past and present role that the medical community has played in promoting perpetualizing um, racism, determine how the, the local social economic educational divide can create, has created poor health outcomes. And then say local, I mean here in the DC area. And then embrace the challenge to recognize personal perceptions and maybe even reorganize cultural structures of our own. So um, racism and healthcare inequities and poor outcomes are sort of intricately involved in um, one of the things that we have to recognize, acknowledge, and understand is that the medical community has sort of been in the middle of this um, intricacy. And so we sort of have to take ownership and figure out what to do about it. Our complicated history um, that is real quick, and this is national, it's not us necessarily us personally, but nationally, that slavery and post-slavery practices created some dangerous conditions and um, physical and mental torture, so physical and mental health um, issues there. And then from 1619 to the present, um, Black Americans have experienced racially motivated violence, economic exploitation, disenfranchisement, exposure to environmental harm, decreased access to health care, and therefore poor health outcomes. Um, the problem is our government was more than complicit. Um, it actually benefited um, and sort of even um, profited. Um, here was a quick slide about how in Virginia, so we talk about 1619 where um, the slaves first came, but in Virginia particularly, there, um, the cash crop was tobacco and there were indigenous servants that were already here um, that were non-Black, but once um, the African slaves arrived, there began to be um, laws enacted that allowed um, these differences and one is that, or differentiations, and one is that in the 1640, there was a law that was passed for, um, for masters and the white servants to be able to carry arms, but black servants obviously could not. Um, and that sort of further marginalized them. And then in, um, a couple of years later, that black women were taxable. Um, and so there was a difference now between the black women who were slaves and the white indentured servants. This is just a quick deed of um, a state cell that showed that, you know, even one of our founding fathers, Thomas uh, Jefferson, had slaves that were being sold. And then this is, um, interestingly, a, a message that was posted in Boston um, and basically showing that in, in the northern areas um, that people who were freed Blacks were actually um, had to be in fear of being um, kidnapped and put into bondage in the South. Um, and even the um, police, uh, as you see, it says both watchmen and police officers of Boston were responsible for some of these acts. So there's a real fear and there was a, a conscious fear of sort of law enforcement and law. But that was like legal, um, you know, representation and what, how the law may have um, contributed. But what was the medical role um, in this racism um, that we were perpetuating in America? One of the problems is most of us are in this profession recognize, at least in the modern age, that you know we have an obligation to first do no harm. But the question is to whom? Um, so there's a couple of people that you know just kind of know about Dr. Benjamin uh, Rush, Dr. Thomas Hamilton, uh, Dr. Marion Sims, and Dr. Crawford Long, as well as just some of the early um, practices of some of the medical schools and scientists in uh, public health service. So. Dr. Benjamin Rush was a signer of the Declaration of Independence. He was credited as being the father of American psychiatry. He was a good friend of uh, Benjamin Franklin and um, Alexander Hamilton. Um, and he was a prominent physician at the time. Dr. Uh, Thomas Hamilton, he conducted medical experiments uh, to prove biological differences between races. And most of you may know Marion Sim, uh, Sims as being credited as the father of gynecology. 
Uh, and I'm not sure if you know, but there's also uh, Crawford Long, who was credited with discovering anesthesia. Well, Benjamin Rush is, um, he was a medical professor. And one of the things that he was known for is at the University of Pennsylvania, he sort of introduced the idea into the curriculum uh, that there were these racial differences uh, between white and black. And he taught specifically that blackness was a form of leprosy um, and sort of he promised this sort of national future free of black Americans and that the country's destiny would be white. And what's more, most important about this is that because he was an educator, um, it was kind of clear in the beginning that white physicians sort of uh, positioned themselves as expert on racial differences that were based on this fallacy of biology. Um, the thing about him was in 1793, he was very instrumental in the um, yellow fever epidemic in Philadelphia that lasted until about um, November, from the summer to November. But what was interesting at that time is he enlisted the free African Americans in um, Philadelphia to sort of um, take care of those victims of yellow fever. Um, he sort of made them essential labor during the epidemic. And one of the reasons he did this is because he um, believed that African Americans were immune to the fever. Um, and this was based on some supposed biological difference between race. Later on, they, of course, they found that the vector was a mosquito and that we were all susceptible. But these are some of the early thoughts um, just sort of propagated by prominent physicians. Thomas Hamilton was someone who we don't have a picture of, but this guy here was his subject, John Brown. And he did a lot of experiments and he was just obsessed with the idea that there were these differences between black and white. Um, and he went so far as to do experiments burning um, and causing blisters because he wanted to prove that uh, black skin was thicker and that um, this um, subject um, actually eventually fled. Um, he escaped and he wrote a book, um, uh, an autobiography about just sort of the torture that he experienced. Um, but this was someone who was lent to this, to this position um, by a local um, slave master. So many of you know that uh, Marion Sims, the father of gyneco gynecology, was a little controversial because um, although he developed these pioneering tools like the modern day speculum and some surgical techniques that, are very, that were very helpful, one of which um, helped cure, uh, one of the techniques he helped cure was a uh, uh, vesicle vaginal fistulas um, in women who had um, difficult childbirth. Um, the problem was he did a lot of his uh, experiments on some of the slaves, three particular slaves that he owned, up to 30 um, operations on one. And he did this without anesthesia and without consent. Therefore, it raised questions of the ethical you know, implications of his procedures. Um, and the other thing to know about him is before these gyne before and after these gynecological experiments, he was also testing surgical treatments using shoemaker uh, tools on enslaved black children, um, trying to find a cure for neonatal tetanus. And he did this with little to no success. Um, and then Long was someone who experimented on a couple of slave boys using ether. Um, he was trying to decide for anesthesia, which you could and could do. Um, how much you could use, um, when you could get the pain to stop. Um, but it was very interesting that, that all of his um, sort of early successes were based on, this, um, on these uh, experiments. And he eventually did a successful removal of a tumor, removal of a tumor of a white man, um, not harming his patient, but it was based on these experiments. So in terms of the medical community in general or the science community in general, there are other things that have just happened, things to know about. This is um, just a picture of uh, what we call, they called body snatchers at the time or resurrectionists. But there were medical schools in particular, the Medical College of Georgia and the Medical College of Virginia that would dig up uh, bodies from um, nearby grave sites. And most of these were slave grave sites and slave cemeteries. Um, without permission, stealing bodies for cadavers for their um, medical students because there were more students than they had. Um, then there was the um, Eugenics Society of America. They sort of pushed the idea of the fact that you could sort of um, choose and select some positive traits, which obviously meant you could deselect negative traits. And at the time, those negative traits uh, were, you know, ethnicity, um, people with low IQs, um, just various things that they thought were uh, sort of defectives. And so this is a picture of a, of a woman. They did a lot of um, sterilizations in, um, based on these laws and based on the society, a lot of sterilizations in prisons. 
And um, interestingly, um, Hitler himself and what was going on with the camps and the Holocaust really uh, stated that they they modeled um, some of their experiments off of these eugenics um, laws that were created here in America. And then lastly, there was the Tuskegee study all of us know about um, and should be ashamed of because the United States Public Health Service uh, was a part of this experiment of over 600 black men um, who for 40 years were not treated, um, were um, injected with syphilis and we sort of just watched uh, what the sequelae were. So now we do know that the primary, secondary and tertiary sequelae of, you know, of syphilis, what that looks like um, but it was all because we chose to um, refrain from treating, although we had found out at this time that penicillin was the treatment, we withheld that treatment. So that's on a national level, right? So when you kind of look back and you see some of the things that we participated in, we just have to recognize and acknowledge that there's a reason um, that there might be a distrust um, and that the relationship with patient and um, physician or a physician assistant or nurse or whoever is sort of um, representing the healthcare system might be um, tainted um, and that we may have to do a little bit of work in, in showing, um, showing up for our patients. But on a local level, there are also some um, determinants that developed um, sort of this poor South. And it's not just about the economics, but it actually created uh, determinants of health. So Ward 7, 29 neighborhoods, which is roughly 72,000 people, and most of us who live here know that it's bordered by the Anacostia River, PG County, and Ward 8. And it um, is actually a home to several civil rights, uh, I mean, uh, civil war fort sites um, that are listed here. Fort DuPont was the largest city, is the largest city-owned park in the district. But um, during the early years, Europeans had claimed the land, uh, pushed out the Native Americans that were there, um, and they set about c- cultivating, of all things, tobacco, which we talked about earlier, which was a cash crop. And of course, you needed the labor-intensive, um, you know, uh, it was labor-intensive and they needed people to work that land. And so therefore, a lot of the, um, the enslaved Africans were in this area in Ward 7 because this is where the farms were for the tobacco. In Ward 8, also 12 neighborhoods. Um, Those are the um, things that are the borders and it was mostly farmland, again, also in the early history of Washington, namely dairy farms. And um, it's one, it has one of the oldest um, neighborhoods and which used to be called Uniontown and later on it was named um, Anacostia. It was designed to be affordable uh, for the working class, many of whom were employed across the river at the Navy Yard. And the initial subdivision was carried carried restrictive covenants. So it prohibited sale, rental, or lease for anyone that was of African or Irish descent. So you had this property, but it could only be owned by um, non-Black and even non-Irish, which is very interesting at the time. And then Frederick Douglass was actually a former slave who actually bought his freedom and settled here. And his house still remains a a national historic site. The thing is that during the Civil War, it was protected by these forts. And then after the war, the the land was given back to the original owners. Um, It was renamed Anacostia. And the property deeds, however, remained restricted to ownership of those who were white. Um, And so you had a lot of white residents at the time, but then opportunities became available in other parts of the city. Um, What was interesting about this is that as you um, got these opportunities, white landowners uh, fled from the 7th and 8th wards, so from the southern part of the city, but they maintained ownership. And um, that was, uh, you know, and again, so this created a problem because the people they lived, they owned it, but they didn't live there. What happened was they began to... um, create city zones um, or zoning laws that were allowing single family and low density um, uh, areas in the other parts of the city, Um, but it created, but created these high density um, and multi-unit living spaces in Ward 7 and 8. So you had this overcrowding um, and restrictions. And so one of the things to know is in DC, almost the entirety of Ward uh, 3 land zone is for residential 
um, single family homes, while multifamily homes occupy almost all of Ward 8. So this isn't just an economic divide, this is a, um, this is a deadly divide because they were prohibited from living in these other neighborhoods. Um, and public, private, public and private housing options were limited, they became overcrowded, but there was also little investment made in these areas, parts of the city. And so only about 12% um, of these homes, um, it says here, they lack running water as well as electricity. There were also places where industrial sites were, landfills and toxic waste sites um, were placed. And so there was um, intentional um, areas where these, um, where the Black Americans live, they gave an image of them as slum dwellers in the eyes of their um, white counterparts. So this wealth and poverty obviously then began to be created. It excluded anyone from having land, passing land down that was Black, but of course the um, white residents were able to build equity in their homes and um, become economically stable and send their children to college using, these, using this money. And then there were patterns of um, segregation and disinvestment. Um, and so all of this really um, resulted in these health disparities and poor outcomes. Today, middle and high income black families are far more likely to live in these lower income neighborhoods to be uh, within their community um, than white families. And they continue to experience this, um, these rates of upward uh, difficulty, upward economic mobility. So this is just really quickly median household income in DC. If you see the line of divide, most of the um, income is um, above that left and to the left of the line and least, um, the least amount is to the right of the line and it's below. And it shows you on this slide that in Ward 3, this is up until 2017, um, but in Ward 3, upwards of 120,000 was the median income. But down here in Ward 7 and 8, you're as low as below um, 40 and 20, 25, which is below poverty line. Then there's food deserts. Most of the food deserts are over here in Ward 7 and 8 compared to the other wards. Um, and then there's the rent burden by ward where you're spending more than 30% of your income on rent. Um, and so all of these are creating issues, disproportionate need for resources. Why? Because 40% of the youth in the um, city um, live here in, in Ward 8. 49% uh, of the children under age 18 are in these wards. 51% receive a SNAP. Uh, almost 16,000 TANF and almost 17,000 received WIT. So there's a lot of resources needed in this very small part of the um, city, but it's overcrowded. Today's lack of access, there's all kinds of things like um, the fact that there's only three grocery stores in Ward 7 and 8, one in Ward 8, which is for 79,000 people, remember, and two in Ward 7. Um, and then there are lots of uh, people with disabilities, but very few have access to cars, and so getting back and forth to uh, doctor's appointments and getting back and forth to healthcare facilities is an issue. Um, and when it comes to um, food access and having these food deserts, these grocery store gaps cause implications um, with diet, um, eating at fast food places versus having access to fresh food. So there's a higher rate of diet-related diseases. And in Ward 8 in particular, there's five times more likely um, mortality from diabetes um, than those who live in Ward 3. So um, it, right here, to show oxymoron of poverty, um, like the sign there, stop and keep going. You have very little food, but you're overweight and obese, but that's because of the poor um, nutritional value of the food. And other health disparities exist, high teen birth rates, HIV infections, um, lots of um, kids in the foster care system, even though there's been a steady decline in the foster care system um, in terms of the numbers of kids nationally in the District of Columbia and particularly in wards five, seven, and eight, there um, we have four times the national rate. And um, other disparities include um, things like mental health provider shortages, um, poor health, poor oral health status. Um, and again, there's just because there are very few providers in these wards. 
So managing health disparities, it's our mission. As we look at why these things exist and what the sort of history is, we need to learn. And one of our goals is to offer quality and comprehensive primary care and um, learn to properly diagnose and treat these health conditions. Um, and the fact is, because each community is unique, as we point out what some of the issues are, maybe there's toxic waste or maybe there's you know high asthma, whatever the issues are, um, each center or each area should be, or we should be considering patient-centered care. Our purpose is to eradicate health disparities that exist in these communities. And the problem is there is an increased burden for these specific populations with differences in rate of disease, health outcomes, health access, and treatment. So how is it that we want us to learn and consider managing healthcare disparities? We want to focus on the patient-centered care. So who is in our community? What's the population like? What are the residents experiencing? Um, what do we know about our communities that we're working in? And is this information firsthand knowledge or hearsay? Like how much have you really looked at the history and know why um, these certain wards are, are, have lower, low income and high poverty and high crime. Promote patient dignity and personal responsibility. So we want to create these partnerships with our patients, providing details about their diagnosis, really educating them on their level, meeting them where they are, um, and really making them partners with us as we treat them and as we treat their family members. We want to learn to improve our communication. That's what this is all about meeting patients again where they are, determine what their literacy is. Um, consider maybe um, smartphones or apps, uh, things especially with our teens today, and then give some written information that may have larger words or pictures or things that can be explained easily. And then one of the roles and goals for us, each of us here, is to develop cultural competency and cultural humility, really understanding where our shortcomings are, why we have the beliefs that we have, um, are they um, just based on things that we've seen and heard, or is it something that uh, we've actually learned about? So what is cultural competence? Um, this is a learned skill. It enables us to increase our understanding and appreciation of cultural differences, and really recognize that we have more similarities than differences. Um, it allows providers to understand and appreciate and work within the cultures that um, other than a culture other than their own. And it involves though the willingness and the ability of a system to value their patients. So not just you as an individual, but how does your system value both the, the uh, culture of the patient and the uh, learned experiences of the patient, the shared experiences of the patient. And this is gonna help us deliver services Cultural humility is a little different. It's a process that requires an understanding that each of us has something that we can learn from the others. So that's where the humility comes in. Sometimes we walk in and we just assume and believe that we have all the answers and we know what's best, but we have to know that there's a learning process that we have to go through with our patients. What is going on in this community? What access do you have? What barriers do you have? How can I be of some help? It requires that the individual continually engage in self-reflection and self-critique um, as lifelong learners and reflective practitioners. And it's designed to address and repair the power imbalances. It eliminates this paternalistic approach um, that um, we've sort of learned and that's been sort of perpetuated in medicine and it really develops uh, a quality healthcare system where we're again partners in, but these are tools that you have to create and learn. And then it establishes meaning, you wanna establish some meaning connections. Just get to know your community, like take time. You wanna to tour, you know, the surrounding streets, the surrounding um, historical sites, what makes it special, shop in the local stores um, for food items, find out what's, what they have available, what they don't have access to. Take the time to get to know the community leaders um, and maybe the community partners and learn what the resources are that are in your community so it can make you a better um, advocate for your patients in your community. And then take time to become familiar with the barriers that your patients are facing on a daily issue. So what are some of their issues with local transportation? You know, that will give you appreciation when they're maybe late for an appointment or they're coming in with several children and they had to take um, several buses to you. Um, the poor quality of foods will help you 
learn how to be, maybe better um, advise them about diet and exercise when you're talking to them about certain conditions that you want them to address. Um, and then um, just understand that there's a, sometimes a lack of customer service um, and relatively high prices that they're facing, especially given that their income level may be low. So what are some of the ways that you can participate in helping advocate for them and give them better um, alternatives? Um, wherever you are, consider attending a town hall meeting in your ward. I have here information about Ward 8, but that's not the only place that you can attend uh, a town hall meeting. So these are just ways that you can become um, aware of, of what your shortcomings may be or just where you can um, improve your communication with your patients. So I'm going to pause here. And... You ready? I'm gonna mute myself. Hi. Um, I, I paused there so we can um, incorporate Dr. Shaker from here. Awesome. <laughs> Dr. Straker, the floor is yours. I will pull up your slides in just a second. Okay, well, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lewis Reglin. This is, um, <clears throat> so what we're going to do for the, for the next 15 minutes is take the information that she gave us and think about how to communicate about racism to whoever. Um, let me just click that so I can get that off my screen. All right. So first of all, I want to thank the Omega chapter of Delta Omega. You can change it. Um, thank the, the chapter of Delta Omega, um, the Omega chapter, and for, for, having me, for having this talk all together. And so, first of all, I want you to think for a second for yourself, and if you want, you can put it in the chat, but why should we communicate about racism, okay? Um, and I'm gonna go forward, but you could use the chat to, um, to well, I get, it, the chat's available. You can use the chat to, um, to express your views. So, click. So, so some reasons to do about it, sometimes we wanna communicate about racism because we're, we're trying to change an opinion change someone else's opinion. We might even, if we're working and, and thinking about it from a public health standpoint, if we're working in an agency or with a group of people, we might want to change practice or a policy. And we realize that um, um, we need to talk about racism to help get to that change. Another reason is to be an ally. And to be an ally means to um, use your privilege and from wherever you're at in a way that you can um, sometimes interrupt and stop uh, things that you are, see that are perpetuating or supporting racism. Okay, next slide. So now, with whom do you want to communicate about racism? And so there are a bunch of, there are different folks. Um, it can be your peers, and that means your coworkers, it can mean your friends, it can be agency people, uh, especially if you're working somewhere, it could be the people who are, are, who are above you in that agency. Could be your family. You might want to communicate. Maybe you're not a person of color, and you want to uh, communicate with people of color about racism and and just others. So these we have to think about who our audience is as much as we want to think about um, why we should talk with them. Next slide. And we want to think about what are the challenges of com communicating about racism. So these are some that I've come across in conversations with people. It doesn't necessarily mean these are yours, you might have others. But a lot of people say to me, they don't wanna offend someone because the word racist has this, such a negative connotation and people think that racism means that they are a bad person. And if, if you are racist, I wouldn't say that's a good thing to be, but, um, but they're worried about offending people or people not feeling that they can be articulate about race. And part of that is um, because in this country, we don't talk about race or racism. And so the, it, it becomes an uncomfortable thing to, to, to talk about. It might be a power dynamic. Maybe they want to talk about racism, but there's a per, the person they want to talk to it 
is a person who is in a, has more authority over them in wherever, let's say a working condition. Um, or the belief that I just won't change anyone's mind. Uh, and so uh, why should I even start? Or the other one that I'm not an expert on racism. And, um, and I would tell you, if you live in the United States, everybody's an expert. They just don't realize they're an expert. Uh, and then it's emotionally charged. In this country, because we haven't talked about race and we definitely haven't talked about racism, then the conversation about racism feels very emotionally charged because there, there are a lot of people who've been oppressed and hurt through this process. And then the other one is that it feels confrontative that um, you know, it's a clash and a lot of people don't feel like they wanna deal with conflict that way. So next I'm gonna talk about some definitions and these are real quick definitions and part of this is to mimic some ways to think about doing it. So we all know that race is a social construct. I'm not gonna go into that. I want quickly thinking that racism is a, a failure to act or, a, or an action that um, accepts, supports or reinforces racism a racial inequality. So that means it's an act of omission, meaning not doing anything and allowing things to continue, or it's an act of commission, meaning that there's, the action itself um, is supporting or reinforcing racism. Anti-racism, on the other hand, is an, un is an intentional um, refuta uh, refuting of racism. It's active. Um, racism can be passive. If not doing anything is a passive thing. It could be unintentional. I don't mean, didn't mean for that to happen, but it happened, okay? Anti-racism is an intentional act. And then privilege is, an, is having an advantage and having an, um, an inequity of advantage because if you have an advantage, someone has a disadvantage. And one thing that a lot of times we don't talk about in the country about racism is whiteness. And, we're let's be using the, the idea that whiteness is uh, our char is characteristics of the dominant white culture, and that's whether it's the person recognizes it or not. And with that comes some um, privilege, which is usually unrecognized. Racism really is stems from an ideology that supports that one group is inherently superior to others. Um, and that can be anything that can be displayed with jokes, slurs, you know, or it can be things with hate crimes, but the bottom line is this ideology, which Dr. Lewis Reglan talked about before, which we recognize has started from the beginnings of this country, has then created customs, norms, traditions, um, and laws, which become policies that are embedded in our institutions, our, our legal system, um, and even our cultural systems in the country. And so looking at racism at three different levels, the institutional level and the structural and systematic level are, are, are the same. Um, then they're all, that's all the same. So you can use the word interchangeably. There's, there are academics who actually specify in each word, but in essence, they're the same. Um, Dr. Kamara Jones has outlined these three uh, areas of, of racism. The next level is interpersonal. That's the one most Americans are familiar with, which is you call somebody a name. That's when you, um, you, you actively discriminate against somebody and treat them differently. And they, they think that's always an intentional thing, but it's not. Um, and then internalized uh, racism is actually when the, um, this, the I'm going to say there's two parts. Dr. Jones really talks about internalized racism occurs when the racial group that's oppressed um, by racism actually embodies or takes on the superior, the supremacy idea of the dominating group of, of, of whites. And you've, you've seen it, um, or maybe you've heard about cases of um, uh, Kenneth Clark, who did the, who was involved in the um, Brown versus Board of Ed, where black children would prefer to have a white doll over the black doll. Okay, so it's that kind of thing. But the other part of internalized racism that we don't talk about much is what happens to the group that's dominant. That's when they accept the ideas, whether consciously or unconsciously, and they use those ideas to, um, for their actions and decisions. So internalized racism, I believe, happens on both parts. Next slide, please. So this is Dr. Jones's um, definition. And the reason I use it is Dr. Jones was uh, the president of past is in the media, not immediate, but she's a past president of the American Public Health Association, I think in 2016. 
Um, and this is a definition that she gives in her story or his book called The Levels of Racism, which is a framework called The Gardener's Tale. And in it, and I just want to highlight a couple pieces, it's a system of structuring opportunity, okay? And it assigns value and it unfairly disadvantages people, communities, and groups and in the process. And so that's where we think about racism. And this is the definition of racism I am talking about when I'm talking about racism for the rest of the talk. Okay. And uh, I, I wanna set that this is the definition I'm talking about. Okay, we're gonna move forward. So why address racism in public health? Well, as you've seen from Dr. Um, Dr. Lewis Reglin, we, the underlying basis of racial health disparities is racism. It's the things that have been embedded from the time enslaved Africans and actually the things that have been embedded from the time Europeans arrived and pushed out the, in, the native indigenous people of, of, of the country, okay? And that addressing it improves the health of the public. And that's what our job is as public health people is to improve the health of the public. And we know that when you improve the health of, of the of groups that are, that are quote unquote lower in, in, in the totem, well, I won't say that, lower in the structure, you will rise all, you know, as they say, rising all boats. We know that things that work for them work for other people. And you might have to customize it a little, but it's important. And the re one of the reasons the US is so low on the rest of the world, when we look at things like infant mortality or life expectancy, racial health disparities is one of those reasons, uh, in addition to other inequities. So let's start talking about communicating. One, you gotta start with communicating with yourself. And so that means reflecting, reflecting on yourselves. What are your values? What are important to you? And in that, what are your experiences and how have those values and experiences been involved with race and racism? and any other types of oppression. Two, you got to study. You have to learn. Many people do not know the history of the United States. Dr. Reglin, I mean, Louis, Reglin, Louis Reglin just gave us a good um, little quick history, at least in terms of how um, American history has affected us, that it looks in terms of medicine and health. Three, listen. You want to listen to people who've been oppressed, people who are of color, and listen to their experiences. Um, and, and this is not, so communicating with yourself so you can realize it's not just about you, it's really about the world that, that you want to change. Next slide is we communicate with other people. And in order to do that, A, we have to accept that this is going to be uncomfortable. And we're not used to talking about it in the country, in this country, and um, it will seem uncomfortable. But the more you do it, you know, as they say, practice makes perfect, perfect, perfect. So the more you do it, the better off will be. And now, you, now you've now figured out who you want to talk to, figure out the purpose that you want to communicate about racism. Is it to call out, meaning calling out? Calling out is a process that you do to interrupt or disrupt uh, acts of racism, particularly when you see them that they're harmful. Maybe it's a macroaggression, maybe it's a microaggression. I'll talk about that in a second, a little more. Calling in is a process that allows there to be a communication, a deeper communication across folks. And then there's the idea of just teaching. You have a group of people or a place that you want to promote learning um, and you're going to help, um, help people develop their knowledge in the area. Next slide. So calling out is a process that's used to disrupt the momentum of racism that exists, whether, like I said, it could be subtle and micro or it could be more macro. If you use it to, uh, to stop further harm, you use it to call attention to this is what's happening. And um, you, you, you can also use it to provide a, a, a safety for the target of racism. So ideas is like sometimes you could be with people and somebody says something and then you need to say, this is not appropriate. It's not unacceptable. It doesn't even need a whole long explanation, but it needs the heart that's there to say, I'm, we're not gonna accept this. The comments are offensive. These are examples of what to say. You should choose different words. These are not our values. These short statements, sometimes people call them bystander. I call them these state type of statements, upstander statements are really important and calling out is really important. And to be an ally, that would be very helpful. It's helpful if you see something happen and you come, people sometimes things have happened in my life and people have come over and said, they shouldn't have done that. 
it would have been much more helpful for me if they had said that in that moment that that person shouldn't have done it. I would have felt more supported. Okay, next slide. Calling in is where you really, un, you, you're be, you call in because you think that the purpose, that the person didn't intentionally um, try to do harm in some way or another to, to a person or to people. And this and harm can be physical, but mostly we're talking about psychological harm. Um, and this is a way to create a deeper discussion and to, and to help that person and, and everybody else focus on reflection. So you might, so examples of things you could say is what sort of impact do you think that comment might make? You know, how might somebody else take that? What, or what did you mean by X, Y, or Z? Um, and, or what was your intent when you said that? Because as I said earlier, your intention and the outcome do not necessarily need, need to be the same. So sometimes helping people connect that the outcome um, that their intention did not get the outcome that they're expecting is important. So that's calling in. And then we've got, um, next slide, is promoting learning or teaching, which is probably one of our roles as, as public health people is to, um, is to help, help do this kind of process. And so one, people don't know history. We need to provide a historical context, one reason to study. Two, Let's look for shared values of folks. One way racism works is it dehumanizes people. So when people realize that we have shared values, and because of time, Dr. Um, Dr. Lewis Reglin did not, was, she was not able to give us an exercise that she does that helps us understand the values that we share. But you start that conversation with the people. You know who the people, they might be your family, they might be people you work with. You wanna pull on the shared values. And then you wanna establish a definition so everybody understands, when I talk to you about racism, you now know what I'm talking about. And then um, we want to explore the data, give some information. Most people don't know that African Americans have one-tenth of the wealth of, of, of white Americans. And this is actually where we talk about connecting the dots. And that really comes from that history that, um, that you just heard about that actually talks about, just here in DC, talks about um, Ward 7 and 8 the history of enslavement of Africans or of taking the land from indigenous people. And then the, um, in, the, the enfranchisement of, of white men to be able to vote, set up a system of laws, practices, cultural rules, which leads to the 20th century having racial segregation, which then leads to inferior um, uh, education and under and unemployment uh, in, and community environments that are deprived of resources like supermarkets, healthcare facilities, or high risk exposure like pollutants, um, social environments of police violence, daily microaggressions and macroaggressions and tr stress and trauma. And all of this is stress that disproport causes disproportionate disease and injury. Thus we have health disparities. It's connecting those dots that will help people to be able to talk about racism and then realize one time is not gonna do it. This conversation needs to happen and be pointed out over and over again. Next slide. So, to, as we're coming toward the end, now we're coming to the end. One, um, you gotta do your homework. Everyone has to do their homework. We all have to learn. You could, we all have gone to the School of Public Health, but School of Public Health can't get you to learn everything you need to know. So you have to do some work on your own. Um, then you have to decide your purpose of communicating racism. And I think that everyone should have, should want to communicate about racism. So decide the purpose for the moment and the group that you're with. Three, you should say the word. The word racism is now part of the American lexicon because of this year when we have seen so much violence against, uh, particularly against African-Americans when we think about George Floyd or Breonna Taylor, or Mart Arbery. Now we've been seeing it over long, but now the American when I say the American, particularly the majority of America, white Americans have come out and said, you know, we, we don't want this anymore. And they're actually using the word racism and systemic racism. And four, we have to continue the work. It's not a one-time deal. It's an ongoing process. Um, it took years to, um, to embed this across the country and put this in our minds and our actions. And it's gonna take work continuously to change it. So next slide, thank you. Um, I just gave some resources that you can, you can use on your own as you're thinking about this. I believe the slides will be made available or at least the talk will be made available online afterwards. Um, 
you know, the easy one that I have at the top is Georgetown has an anti-racist toolbox. It has a glossary of terms. It's got other things, things you can read, things on history, and um, the Aspen ideas to Oh, we lost you, Dr. Straker. Can you oh. unmute? Oh, sorry. Okay, thanks. I'm gonna, okay, um, I just want to point out here the last one, Just Medicine, A Cure for Racial Inequality in Healthcare. This is writ a, a book that is written by our new dean of the School of Law, Dr. Dana Bowen Matthews. It's a really good book. She connects healthcare and it, racial inequality and law, and so it's a really good book to kind of for a public health person to read. So with that, I want to thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Stryker. So we have a few minutes for questions um, at this time uh, and for our speakers. Uh, so we're not going to mute attendees. So if you have any questions, you can add them to the chat box. Um, so we can start with one. Um, for either speaker, I guess. Uh, so what types of what type of advice do you give people you meet in your practice that express to you that they're exper they've experienced racism or racial in inequalities that impact their health? So that's a great question. It depends for me. I guess it depends on um, uh, what it is, who the patient is. I mean, if this is a patient, um, then we have a, a conversation about what um, they think the issue was, you know, I sort of talk to them about it, talk to them, talk through it with them. And then again, my goal is to be an advocate. So I'm, I'm here to advocate for, um, sometimes it, it may be a misunderstanding, but sometimes it's a definite um, omission or, you know, someone ignored their pain or someone ignored uh, certain signs. Um, it can be sometimes tricky because we are all colleagues uh, within the medical field. And so sort of calling out um, individuals for maybe purposefully um, um, mistreating is, is not something we generally do. Our goal is to sort of get the, the health care that's needed at the time um, and then just sort of find out what resources we can provide for them. But, you know, I think that we sort of all come to it from an individual point um, for that patient and just sort of advocate for them to get the right answers and to get them treated properly. Yeah, and um, I, just to add to that, I mean, I think that that is actually the way most of us will say that we, we know that the people that we work with or the people we've seen in medicine did not intentionally come into medicine to hurt people or to do something wrong. Some people may not consciously know what they're doing, and that's a different story. And that's where one of those places that if you're talking with that person, that calling in might be more helpful than just calling out. But sometimes you have to call out. I think the other part is that if I'm talking with a patient about this, um, is that that itself is not enough to allow them not to challenge themselves to overcome that or that that health experience. So you know, um, because. Um, because of history of racism is not a reason to, to take care of ourselves. And so that's the conversation that I have and we look at where can we, what kind of things can we do in the community to empower ourselves to, um, to have better conditions to, to operate under. Thank you. Um, so another question is, what are some of the tools for students to use in confronting racism in an academic setting? <laughs> I think that Dr. Straker definitely pointed out some great ones, right? Um, the, the toolbox that Georgetown has. Um, um, and then there, there's so much literature out there. Um, the black taxes that we want to talk about here is, you know, just because I'm an African-American woman in healthcare and because, you know, Dr. Straker is an African-American male doesn't mean we have all of the answers. People have purposefully written down information and purposefully put tools together for um, individuals to go after purposefully on their own. And it is work that needs to be done. Um, and I, I want to definitely caution against, um, you know, only relying on the relationships that you have 
with black people or with brown people <laughs> to sort of answer um, and, and be your resource um, because it's taxing. It's mm -hmm. It's frustrating. It's tiring um, that you know during the day I um, educate my patients, I educate my trainees, I educate those around me, and then find out that you know friends and acquaintances need me to educate them too. Um, but at the same time, those of us who have not been taught or trained to educate others are still finding ourselves having to educate about why the George Floyd situation was so difficult, why Breonna, you know, why these things are affecting us. So I think it's very important if you're someone who's in the, the profession of, of healthcare um, that you pick up the, some of the books and the resources that Dr. Straker pointed out, just like you pick, pick up your anatomy and your physiology and your chemistry book, because we're undoing, we have to unlearn some of the things that have been taught to us. Um, and again, I just wanted to mention, I had put pause because I did have the exercise that um, I can share that was just about learning and writing down shared experiences on a piece of paper that they can participate in maybe on their own. So um, that should be something that we can share in the, in the, um, in the slides as well as some resources that um, I also wanted to offer in terms of some reading materials. Great, thank you. Um, can you share, if this is for either speaker, so can you share your thoughts on provider unconscious bias and its impact on service delivery? Well, I'll start this time. Um, the, I'll make it one good way to look at it. If you ever get a chance to look at um, uh, the 2003 Unequal Treatment, which is a large document that documented healthcare disparities, racial and ethnic healthcare disparities, in the country that was actually done by the IOM. In it, there's a really great chart that shows you the differences of healthcare um, status from between minorities and whites, and there's a space. And then um, uh, that space, part of that space is really what we call disparities. And the part of disparities are the big things that are legal and regulations and that. And then the other part of disparities really come from the interactions uh, uh, patients with clinicians and with members of the healthcare system. And so clinicians are responsible for part of healthcare disparities. And I'm talking about healthcare and not just health disparities. And so our thinking, and we all know, we're all public health people, we all know about bias and whether it's a, a type one, type of A era or B, we know that bias skews the way you look at things, it skews the data you get, it skews how you interpret it. And so if you're not conscious, if people aren't conscious of the biases that they have, they make decisions and there's studies that document clinicians making decisions because of the bias they have about race or ethnicity. There's actually study that was done and very recently in the last five years that showed that medical students, first year medical students actually believe that blacks have thicker skin and less nerve endings. And so they don't feel pain the same way. Don't know, they didn't get that in medical school, but if nobody talks about it in medical school, it keeps going and it keeps going forward. So we have a role to learn about our implicit biases and to realize that they exist. And then we have to take the challenge of learning about that. And even more being conscious of what the patient's experience is and who they are and being conscious that we're addressing them and not we're just um, operating on a checklist. Thank you very much. Um, so there were a few more questions, but I think we've run short on time. So I apologize if I didn't get to every question, um, but I'm gonna send it back to Sarah for closing remarks. Thank you. Thanks, Megan. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, my name is Sarah Hoffman Graham, and I'm the Assistant Director of Alumni Engagement for the School of Public Health. And so I wanna thank you. I know a lot of you are also students and faculty and staff and friends. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for engaging in this important topic. Most of all, I want to thank um, our two uh, esteemed speakers. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Lewis Reglin. Thank you so much. Dr. Straker, thank you so much. I appreciate you um, sharing your experience with us and your education and your expertise. Um, I think uh, I've learned a lot. Thank you. Um, for those of you who are joining us who are 
uh, members of the School of Public Health community, uh, the Milken Institute School of Public Health community at GW. Um, I want to encourage you to stay engaged. I'm going to drop a um, link to our LinkedIn group where we share things like job openings and announcements and events and good news like that. So I encourage you to stay engaged and keep um, keep uh, up with your uh, school community. Um, if you are an alumnus uh, or alumna of GW, I also encourage you to take advantage of all of the um, opportunities and resources available to you as a, uh, as a part of our alumni community. If you've enjoyed this event and would like to come to other events that are fun or educational or a little bit of both, um, I encourage you to look at the chat uh, box. I just dropped a link to the alumni event calendar. There are a lot of opportunities to keep learning, to build your network, to build your skills, and I hope you'll take advantage of that. Again, I want to thank you for spending your time with us this evening, and thanks, many, many thanks to our speakers and to our hosts from the Delta Omega Honorary Society and Public Health and I hope you all have a wonderful evening. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you.